European <clears throat> Union. What associations come to mind when you hear this word? Freedom, liberalism, democratic values. However, it was not always like this. The relations between countries in Europe after the Second World War were, to put it mildly, difficult, and an incredible hatred towards Germany flourished. In today's video, we will tell you about Jean Monnet. How did a wine merchant manage to become the father of Europe? What role did communists play in the unification of European countries? And what relevance does this have to the present day? Subscribe to our channel, Epoch Icons, like, hit the bell, and support us with a donation. This will help us release new videos more often. All links are in the description. Part 1. Cognac and Wine Jean Monnet was born in 1888 in France in the city of Cognac. His life, like the lives of most residents of this city surrounded by vineyards, was closely connected with alcohol. All the residents of Cognac were divided into two categories, peasant suppliers and negotiants. Negotiant, traders who bought wine from producers and resold it on the market. Thanks to Jean's father, the Monet family moved from the first category to the second, although, of course, they did not reach the heights that their neighbors, the Hennessy, Martel, and Hein families, had been conquering since the 17th century. Cognac was a product of the era of globalization long before the era itself arrived. It was sold all over the world. Therefore, business connections of modest French provincials were established from Singapore to New York. From childhood, Jean absorbed the ancient business traditions of his family like a sponge. His small homeland also contributed to the personal growth of the young businessman. Cognac did not know nationalism even in the era of universal nationalism, and freedom of trade was bread and butter for every negotiant. In this city, the literary expression, to travel the world, was not used. They said, to visit clients. From a young age, Monet began actively visiting clients, which allowed him to get to know the world well and learn English. He did not receive a serious education, but nevertheless, he knew the mechanisms that worked in the city and on Wall Street, and, unlike many in his native country, he understood the culture of the English, Americans, Canadians, Russians, Swedes, Arabs, Greeks. However, Monet did not follow in the footsteps of his family. When the guns roared in Europe in 1914, the 26-year-old negotiant came up with the idea that it would be good to put the entire procurement system for the armies of the Entente under unified control to eliminate the competition of buyers, which was driving up the price of the resources so necessary for waging war. Monet managed to secure an audience with the Prime Minister and soon received an appointment in London, where the Anglo-French Supply Coordination Service was located. Part 2 European connections. So, in the turbulent years of war, our hero became a state supplier. It was here that his skills in establishing connections proved to be incredibly useful. The struggle for resources among the Allies was incredible, and Monet skillfully found the necessary compromise. In the character of the young businessman, there was an amazing combination of love for the free market and the construction of administrative structures. All of this ultimately led Jean to the common market. By the spring of 1918, a committee was established to take control of most of the maritime transport needed to supply the army. The functions of this strange office were poorly understood even by the leaders of the Entente. Monet often had to give explanations. Once, the young supplier was summoned by Clemenceau himself. The situation almost turned sour, but his negotiation skills came into play. When Monet left the Prime Minister's office, the old tiger personally handed him his coat, saying, All right, all right. In our house there is no need for servants. However, the war was coming to an end, and since there was no longer a need to work for the benefit of the French army and the Allied armies, the future father of Europe began to work for peace. He gladly took on the role of Assistant Secretary General in the new post-war organization, that was supposed to contribute to the maintenance of peace in Europe, the League of Nations. By the way, we mentioned it in the video about Carl Gustav Emil Mannerheim, so check it out if you haven't already. 
This is how Monet became acquainted with the hot spots of Europe that fell under the protection of the League of Nations. At that time, even the best minds of Europe were thinking in terms of nationalism, not globalization. Monet encountered this more than once in his attempts to persuade European leaders to exist within the framework of constructive cooperation, rather than being captive to revanchist plans. For example, when trying to persuade the president of Czechoslovakia, Edvard Benesch, that his country should become the leading economic force in the unification with Austria in the project of the Danubian Federation, Benesch sharply replied, Never. I would prefer Austria to disappear. Monet realized that the time for the League of Nations had not yet come. He returned to his hometown to help his elderly father run the family business. However, for a person with such great ambitions, this was clearly not a suitable occupation. A couple of years later, Monet entered big business, becoming the vice president of a major Franco-American financial company. During this time, he managed a major economic operation in Europe at that time, the allocation of a state loan to Poland. In the course of negotiations with the then Polish leader, Józef Pilsudski, in addition to Poland, assistance in overcoming the crisis was provided to many European countries, there were few places left in Europe that the father of Europe had not personally explored. He then attempted to expand his business in America, where the Frenchman experienced failure for the first time. He consoled himself by winning over a young wife from an Italian businessman whom he himself had invited as a guest. Sylvia turned out to be 20 years younger than Jean, and moreover could not obtain a divorce under Italian law. But this did not deter Monet. As a true globalist, he went to Moscow, where he easily registered another young Soviet family, which immediately moved to Shanghai to conduct business. After all, China also needed international loans. In 1936, Monet preferred to complete the construction of capitalism with Chinese characteristics and return to the United States. Part 3. The Collapse of France. Birth of a New Europe. After leaving for the United States, Jean was no longer interested in finance. A new war was looming, and Monet, for the first time in his life, got involved in politics, using his personal experience from World War I to persuade the French, British, and Americans of the need to coordinate supply activities in London. In 1940, France collapsed under the pressure of the German army. The hopes for an Anglo-French federation also collapsed. Monet, who had gone to the United States, had to convince the Americans to produce as much weaponry as possible. He was dissatisfied with the pace at which the American economy was being militarized and demanded different results from President Roosevelt. Monet returned to French public service in 1943 in Algeria, joining the National Liberation Committee formed by de Gaulle. It was something like a government in exile, and thus Monet obtained a ministerial portfolio. His responsibilities included supply and armament. Monet remained in this position until the end of the war. In 1946, due to differences in views, the nationalist de Gaulle expelled the globalist Jean from the government. Their conflict continued until their deaths, and both mercilessly criticized each other in their works. Monet wrote the following in his diary. The development of humanity is the main goal of our efforts, not the glorification of any country, big or small. After resigning from the government, Monet took on the most important role in his life, heading a completely new institution, the Planning Commission. Sitting in the commissioner's chair, he pondered the fate of the Ruhr Industrial Region, which had become a source of sharp conflict between France and Germany in the interwar period. If the purely German region was left under the control of the Allies, it would again undermine the dignity of the Germans, provoke revanchist sentiments, and hinder the construction of a new Europe. If the Ruhr remained part of Germany, who could guarantee that coal and steel would not be used for the creation of another militaristic machine? The solution proposed by Monet was the creation of an international organization that would control all European coal and steel production. This would ensure a common market for these goods, promoting the economic revival of Europe while preventing any state from secretly using these resources for military purposes. The European coal and steel community began its work in Luxembourg on August 10, 
1952. Monet himself headed the organization, although he had reached an age when most people retire. However, coal and steel were just an intermediate stage for him. In an attempt to protect the Western European states from Soviet expansion and the possible resurgence of the Wehrmacht, he tried to unite the European states in a military alliance which, in the post-war Europe, due to the remaining animosity between the countries, turned out to be an unattainable dream. Nevertheless, the invitation of the Americans to join NATO helped solve this problem. In 1955, Monet retired. But even as a retiree, for 20 years he worked tirelessly to strengthen European integration. Only in 1975, at the age of 87, did he fully retire, leaving his project unfinished. In the last four years of his life, Monet managed to write his memoirs. In them, he wrote, The natural incompleteness is a sign of true art. Six years after Monet's death, his compatriot Jacques Delors significantly revitalized the life of the common market, transforming it into the European Union in 1985. The unified European home became one step closer. In our time, we can observe that thanks to the fundamental principles laid down by Jean Monnet, the European Union has grown into one of the most powerful supranational unions on the planet.